Welcome, everyone. Uh, thanks, everyone, for uh, joining us for this evening's lecture, which is the opening event of this week's uh, conference on calculating capitalism. I'm uh, Will Derringer. I'm a fellow here in the Society of Fellows in the Humanities. And on behalf of the Society of Fellows and the Hyman Center for the Humanities, it is my great pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Professor Jacob Soule, Professor of History and Accounting at the University of Southern California. Among the most innovative and ambitious scholars in the field of in intellectual history, Professor Soule's work has uh, shown that to understand the history of thought, we must understand the practical history of thinking, of the many mundane and often overlooked activities that go into making, storing, and transmitting ideas. Professor Soule received his PhD from Magdalen College, Cambridge in 1998, and has subsequently taught at Princeton, Rutgers, and the European University Institute before his current position at USC. His work has been honored by the American Philosophical Society, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation, and most recently, the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, who awarded Professor Soule a MacArthur Fellowship or Genius Grant in 2012. He's the author of nu numerous articles, reviews, and editorials, including a wonderful New York Times uh, op-ed in 2009 titled Avoidance by the Numbers, um, as well as now three books, each of which has recovered uh, in its own way the formative role of a different kind of intellectual practice um, in the shaping of modern politics and governance. So in his first book, Publishing the Prince, History, Reading, and the Birth of Political Criticism, Soule looked at editing and the remarkable influence editors and publishers had in making Machiavelli's political treatise into the ra radical Machiavellian text it came to be. In his second book, the key practice in question was broadly archiving. The information master, Jean-Baptiste Colbert's secret state intelligence system, examines the roles that new techniques for gathering and organizing politically useful data from antiquarian scholarship to architectural plans to espionage played in the development of modern statecraft. And most recently, Professor Soule has turned his focus to a new practice, to accounting. And this evening, Professor Soule uh, will be speaking on his new book, just published by BASIC, entitled The Reckoning, Financial Accountability, and the Rise and Fall of Nations. It's a remarkable tour that spans at least eight centuries and half a dozen countries. Uh, in The Reckoning, Professor Soule examines the profound historical consequences of keeping good books from Lorenzo de' Medici to Lehman Brothers by way of Dante and Dickens. And with that, Professor Soule. Uh, thanks to thanks for coming, and uh, thanks to the Hyman Center, and thanks for Will, to Will. Um, a lot of this book comes from talking to him and from his work, and I feel like we we and some others in this room have been working on this project virtually together for uh, a long time. Um, I basically this book actually started. I, I started by trying to write a book about how people build s successful states. I was very interested in state building, and I was interested in the elements that we often overlook in state building. And so what happened was is I started going into state archives and just looking at the elements um, that, that were there when people were building states, the intellectual interests, the players. And one of the things I found, uh, I found many accountants. And I thought, this is really interesting. I mean, here we are at these great moments in Tuscany, uh, uh, in, the, in the Quattrocento, in the Renaissance, and here we are in France, and here we are in Holland. And each time I found accountants, not just in sort of backup roles, but as these great leaders. And I was like, this is really fascinating. But as I was doing that, uh, the crisis in 2008 hit, and I sat and I watched uh, uh, the crisis unfold, and I watched uh, Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers collapse, and I watched the footage as the accountants moved in at night, only to discover, even though their offices were just across the street, uh, that all the CDOs and their, uh, uh, their, their bundles, their mortgage bundles, were worthless. And I said, this is it. We're going to have this amazing discussion about accounting. And I said, this is, we're going to talk about why it works, why it doesn't work. They're going to hold up the accounts, and we're going to discuss the accounts, because that's what happened in the 18th century. Uh, in Will's work, uh, in the bubble, it happened in fr uh, France later, before the revolution, and um, it never happened. And I thought, wow, that's really an interesting disconnect. I wonder if there's a story here. And it made me sort of start thinking about financial crisis in a cultural way. And right now, there are, there's a lot of interest in financial crisis and, and, and uh, 
income inequality and people are looking to economists. And I sort of thought, at least for this conference, that I would just bring Max Weber back into the picture because I started thinking about culture uh, and, and things like ethics. And I was very, very interested, for example, in, uh, I was very, very interested in why people overlook accounting. So what I started doing is I started not just looking at states that worked, I started actually looking for other moments where accounting failed. Uh, and it was a sort of a, an odd trip. So what I did is I went to the archives of some major states and looked at the accountants and the role of accounting. I went to the Medici and I saw Cosimo's books and they were amazing and I saw how he and people around him used accounting remarkably. But then I also, as, as many business historians know, um, I found that later they fail at accounting, they drop it. This is actually the ledger in which um, uh, Francesco Sassetti stops balancing the books uh, 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 in the 1470s uh, and essentially the Medici Bank goes bankrupt um, uh, or starts going belly up and they start, they start uh, uh, raiding the city coffers. Um, I, and I just kept going. I kept going to these sort of moments. I went to the first accounting manual, which everyone holds up as this incredible moment of rationality and finance. And the book was a flop. Book histor historians and intellectual historians have really never examined this book. And the book didn't do very well to the point where uh, uh, Luca Pacioli, who is credited with this manual, was very unhappy with how the book did because there was a new ethic in Europe at this time as these merchant Italy, sort of as merchant Italy declined um, and Spain rose up, princes became more uncomfortable with actually using accounting themselves. I went and I studied Philip II, who was this, the great emperor of the Spanish Empire, uh, famous for his administration, and I started looking at his accounting policies. And there's a lot of work that's been done on this by um, Spanish business historians. And it was amazing. He came up with some of the most remarkable accounting reforms I've ever seen, incredibly modern, but he never brought them fully through. He, put, he tried to find accountants. There weren't many in Spain. He sponsored the first um, a manual on double entry in Spanish. It didn't do very well. And all of these incredible reforms he did dropped. And I thought to myself, wow, here we actually have this history. And I had set out to write a book about how accounting and states worked. And I ended up sort of writing a book about that, but also how it constantly failed over and over again. And I thought, this might be a cultural tradition. Um, and so I sort of kept digging. Um, and I went to Louis XIV, and it was the same thing. He became fascinated by accounting. He learned accounting. He had his minister, Colbert, um, create golden account books for more than 20 years that he kept in his pocket. But when uh, uh, you know, his accounts went bad during the wars and the building of Versailles, he stopped it too. So this was a sort of amazing thing. At this point, I was looking, I just kept looking. I kept going to different countries and going to different archives and going to different traditions to see what I could find. And I ended up in Holland. Um, and what I found in Holland really struck me. Because when I went there to start looking for the history of accounting, and doing some work in the archives. I also ended up going to museums and also remembering paintings that I had known. And I discovered that there was a huge accounting genre of paintings in, uh, in uh, uh, the, the Flemish Dutch tradition. This is an, an early painting, actually, of the Medici branch uh, uh, director, Tommaso <coughs> Portinari, who gives bad loans and keeps bad books. Um, he actually painted this before he, he had this painted, he paid for it to be painted, before he actually went bust uh, in, in the Bruges uh, branch. But this was a sort of remarkable painting of a financier being judged and facing the final reckoning. And that's actually where I got the idea of the title for the book when I was looking at this painting. But it went on from that. There were images, and you, you can't see it very well, but the Dutch actually were very conscious that their prowess, they were becoming the, the richest small country uh, really on, on earth at this time. And this engraving celebrates that, but it shows Antwerp and all of its wealth. But down here is a, a pictorial explication of double entry bookkeeping. So they actually knew that they had this skill and they openly celebrated the fact that their mastery of this skill gave 